Welcome to the WMPS webinar for Earth Day. Participants are coming into the room. You're all coming in muted to our webinar today. We expect over 100 folks on our call. We'll get started shortly. Thank you for being here. It's a part of the Washington Native Plant Society's Native Plant Appreciation Month celebration. Today's special focus on paintbrushes in peril for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We're gonna give it just a few minutes till about 3.02 to let folks get signed into the meeting. There, and I see that Bill Berkerson is here who is having trouble. Welcome, Bill. And Van Bobbitt. And we have Ron Bockelman today. And Penny Douglas. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have Gail Sklar, our Native Plant Appreciation Month Chair. Welcome, Gail. We have Gail Trotter from South Sound. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm going to give it just one more minute, and we'll get started. You're here today for a beautiful presentation by Mark Egger. I also have with us Elizabeth Gage. Elizabeth will support our question and answer session at the end of our presentation. You please feel free to chat. Say hello to us in the chat. Mark, we have a hi Mark from Sharon Rodman. We have thank you for putting this webinar out. Gail Sklar says, How, happy Earth Day. Mark, thank you for giving this presentation for NPAM. And we have a hi, Bruce. Hi from Bruce in the Yukon. Oh, Thanks for joining us, Bruce. All we right. have a hi from Burian. Vancouver Island is checking in. Somebody says they're in Philadelphia. Guy Nessum. Oh, wow. Very nice. Glad you guys could join us. Well, welcome everyone. You have logged into the Washington Data Plant Society webinar, Paint Precious in Peril, the rare, endangered, and range-limited Castilea species of North America. We are here today with Mark Egger, Mark is a retired science educator, a research associate at the WTU Herbarium at the Burke Museum, and a member of the WMPS since 1984. He has published numerous papers and floral treatments for the genus Castilea and is the lead author for Castilea in the recently published volume, volume 17 of the flora of North America. It's my pleasure to welcome Mark Egger. Thank you, Mark. All right, can everybody hear me okay? I believe so. Um, well, welcome and thanks for attending this webinar. This is the first webinar I've ever uh, actually led. I've watched a couple and also the first PowerPoint I've put together. So if there are any glitches or issues, um, please bear with us. Um, I decided to do this presentation as part of the Earth Day celebration to um, sh spread awareness about all of the various Castileas that are endangered or um, are very range limited and uh, have the potential to become endangered in the future. And uh, also to share some of the really unusual species that I've uh, seen in my travels in Mexico, uh, starting in 
1997 and going for about the next 10 years, I made uh, around 10 or 11 trips to various parts of Mexico, in addition to uh, the US and Canada. And I was able to um, go to some really unusual and exceptional areas um, and get photographs and also meet some of the Mexican botanists who were able to locate a few of the plants that I have not been able to find or, or just not been to the area. Um, so there are a fair number of uh, plants involved in this, so um, you can uh, be going through them in an order arranged by sort of their degree of endangerment. So going to the first slide, um, there are a number of different patterns of distribution and abundance in Castilea. I know this would apply to many large plant groups, but uh, there are some definite trends. There are species which are extremely abundant and widespread, uh, some of them nearly continent-wide. Continent um, there are others that are regionally common, ones that it may be west coast, east coast, and so on. Uh, then there are some that are a little bit more geographically restricted, but um, are very common and easy to locate and fairly widespread within the, the area. Uh, then there are a group of species that are geographically restricted, um, but limited uh, and limited to specific habitat types, but they don't have any particular endangerment factors. Um, for instance, they might be protected within national parks or uh, be common enough that even if they lose some, they uh, aren't going to be hitting the endangered species list anytime soon. Uh, then there's another category, which actually is a fair number of species that are geographically restricted and habitat limited, and they face um, significant threats. Uh, of a wide variety of types, whether it's um, housing development, agricultural development, cattle grazing, logging, uh, many different sorts of threats. And again, this would be true of many plant groups, but it's particularly true of species that I study. Um, there are a few gastileas that have become extinct in recent times, and uh, we'll deal with those right at the very end. And then there are some that uh, have been pretty endangered and came close to the point of being at risk of extinction, but which have um, begun to recover from those threats um, due to a lot of, well, partly to listing under the Endangered Species Act. The importance of that act uh, can't be overemphasized in this, uh, but also by the, the good work of people who are, you know, dedicated to making sure that plant species don't uh, become extinct. Uh, so we'll kind of look at e each of those factors as we go through the show. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, talking about some of the species that are abundant and widespread, uh, these are mostly species which are well known to people who live in those regions. Uh, back east there's Castilea coccinea, which is quite widespread in the east of the Rockies although in some states due to agriculture, agricultural development, they be, become pretty rare. Uh, the C. pallida complex uh, up in the boreal areas, it spreads not only from uh, Eastern Canada, but all the way across the Bering Strait and throughout most of Eurasia. They're not in the Scandinavian countries, but they come very close uh, in the Ural Mountains in Russia. Uh, there's not very many species in those, uh, and they tend to be polyploid, so their taxonomy is kind of a mess. Uh, and also the difficulty of studying them with many of the species being described from Russia in Russian and the types not being available for study uh, in the West. So, uh, and, but they are very widespread species. Then there's uh, Castilea arvensis, which is the only truly weedy species in the genus that is uh, very common throughout almost all of Latin America, South America, uh, Central America, and Mexico. Oddly, uh, it's never been recorded in the U.S., um, though it comes very close to, to the U.S. border in Tamaulipas in Northeast Mexico. Uh, then, of course, one of these species that 
uh, we are very familiar with is Scastillia miniata, uh, very widespread throughout most of the mountains in North America. Second category are ones that are very common but are pretty restricted to particular regions or mountain ranges. Some examples of these would be Castellea patriotica, which is, uh, occurs in southeast Arizona and some of the mountain ranges there, uh, and is common in the limited areas where they occur, but you have to really look for them in the U.S. On the other hand, it's one of the characteristic species in the northern Sierra Madres in, in northwestern Mexico. Uh, Castellea linaria loba is a common species of the foothills and the Sierras, um, in addition to several of the other old owl's clover or orthocarpus species that were moved into Castellea. Um, linaria loba is one that is predominantly found in the western foothills of the range. Uh, then Scor Scorzoneri folia uh, is a widespread species in east, eastern Mexico and extends down into Oaxaca. Uh, and um, this photograph here is from Tamaulipas, um, or rather Nuevo Leon, um, along with one of the endemic penstemons from that area. It's quite a lovely plant. And then uh, Castellea Mexicana is, occurs in southwestern Texas, uh, and then extends through much of northern Mexico. All right. Um, then there are the range-restricted species, which are still pretty local, common, common locally, and are not really in danger, um, but are limited to particular areas. This includes some really uh, beautiful plants, um, Tapino clada, which is abundant in some of the high mountain meadows in western Guatemala, um, and certainly is not endangered, but it's very limited to that area. Uh, Pearsonii is found in the Sierra Nevada up in the higher elevation meadows, kind of subalpine into the alpine. Uh, and then one of the most unusual of Castellea's Castellea roei uh, is found in the Sinaloa and Durango area and down into Nayarit in western Mexico. Uh, it also is abundant in its particular habitat, which is dripping wet cliffs and wet meadows. Um, and since there are a lot of barrancas, uh, deep canyons with moisture coming down, at least in the wet seasons, uh, these plants can become extremely abundant uh, in, within that local range. So moving on to um, geographically restricted and habitat uh, limited, but um, and tend to not be as common as some of those in the last category. Um, these would be Castileas that could be called sensitive species or monitorless species, kind of ranging between those two. And um, <clears throat> one of these is one of the forms of Castilea affinus. Uh, affinus is one of those regionally abundant species, but there is a, a form of this which is called either variety or subspecies neglecta. Uh, which is found mostly in the San Francisco Bay Area in the northern uh, region, mostly in Marin County, but a few records outside of there. And it's um, yellow as opposed to the commonly red or red-orange uh, affinus that's uh, one of the, probably the most common Castilla in uh, Western California. Um, <clears throat> it's also a serpentine uh, endemic, and so it's only found in a few places like Ring Mountain, and some of the other uh, hills around there in the Northern Bay Area. Um, also another uh, California local plant that's quite abundant where it occurs, but in, in a very limited area is um, Ambigua variety Humboldtiensis. Uh, it's a salt marsh species and is only found in salt marshes around uh, the Humboldt Bay Area. Uh, there are a few records from similar marshes a little bit farther north into Del Norte County. Um, I've always wondered whether it crosses the border into Oregon, but we haven't found any records of it there so far. Uh, then it extends down a little bit south to the mouth of the Eel River. But, uh, that's about it for its range. Um, if you want to see it, Humboldt Bay is definitely the best place to look.
It is a beautiful plant and unlike most of Finus, which has uh, whitish uh, bract tips, um, these are purple in this species and they get especially interesting as they age like with the uh, plant on the middle right side of the picture. Um, another form of ambigua that's also rare and restricted to a particular region is um, <clears throat> variety in salutata. Uh, as you can see here, it's um, a little bit different from the typical ambigua, a little bit more brightly colored. The bracts tend to be pink uh, or white tipped, and the corollas are more uh, expanded and colorful than some of the typical forms of ambigua that you find in Washington and Oregon and some of the other uh, salt marshes in California. Um, these, this particular form does not occur in the wet marshes the way that uh, the Humboldtiensis form occurs, but is limited to sandy meadows, uh, kind of on the bluffs above the actual beaches. And it is pretty rare. It's only found in a few areas, mostly around the Monterey Bay area. <clears throat> um, one that we described it just a couple of years ago, a few years ago, is uh, variety medii. Uh, this is very limited in distribution uh, to just a few um, vernal pool areas that are very thin soil over basalt rock. Uh, and most of the populations actually occur on the property of a, a vineyard, a wine grower, uh, who is basically done a conservation easement program with uh, people in Napa County. And uh, so the populations there are preserved, but they're all, it also makes access to see them a little bit difficult. But um, some of the folks that work in the Napa County plant conservation efforts have, um, have a good relationship with the owners and they are fairly secure at this time. Um, interestingly, although we originally called it a variety of ambigua. A recent DNA research by Dave Tank and some of his associates um, at the University of Idaho uh, have determined that it likely uh, deserves full species recognition, that it is actually as separate from the typical ambigua as many of the other annual orthocarpus species are previously orthocarpus. Um, so eventually, when the research is published, it will likely be elevated uh, up to full species status as Castilea medii. Uh, the name derives from the family, the Mead family, who are, uh, of course, instrumental in the continuing um, existence of this species. Uh, now we're heading down to the Aquarius Plateau. This is a, a high elevation area in southern Utah and uh, this plant is limited to that area and one other high elevation area nearby uh, and it's been damaged quite a bit by excessive livestock grazing on Forest Service land and other private and other property owners in that area. Uh, however, Recent, recently, it's made some recovery as the livestock grazing levels were reduced. Uh, when I was there to see the plant originally, I took the photograph of this um, cattle exclosure, uh, and you can see the, the difference between the protected natural meadow area within the fence and the, the grassy sagebrush area outside the exclosure where the cattle were free to roam and were actually roaming there as I was taking the pictures. Um, I, and it wasn't just a fence effect. I wandered all out through this sage meadows there and didn't find a single paintbrush in any of the surrounding habitat. Uh, but within the, the enclosure, they were fairly common. Uh, it's not a particularly showy species, but is um, unique in several features from uh, related species. Uh, this is one that I actually haven't seen very high on my list of plants that I'd like to see. Uh, these pictures were obtained by John Redman, uh, who has done great work with the flora of Baja California and is certainly one of, if not the expert on the flora down there. Uh, these were pictures he obtained just recently from uh, the Cape region down in southern Baja 
of Castilea beldingii. Uh, this used to be in its own genus, Clevelandia beldingii, uh, but DNA research in the last decade or so has shown that it actually nests within Castilea, along with a couple of other species that we'll see later on that uh, used to be in different genera but are now regarded as Castileas. As you can see, there uh, doesn't look much like a typical paintbrush, but the chromosome numbers, the DNA, and other things um, go along with including it in ca Castilea. And the corollas are not all that much different. They have two united petals up above and three below. It's just the, the lower lip is quite a bit different than, than a typical Castilea. Uh, in any case, this plant is um, basically a hurricane-related pl plant. Um, many years they don't come up at all, but in the good years where there's plenty of moisture, they do bloom in the very early part of the year, February, in, in those areas following hurricane moisture. Uh, this is the first plant, first Castilea that I described with Bob Minky from um, Oregon. And uh, we described this to honor Ken Chambers, who is the person that I took my very first systematic botany class from at Oregon State uh, many years ago. Uh, when I was in the teaching program, I was also becoming interested in, in plants as well. And uh, Ken had written a paper about an undescribed Castilea in the coast range, and both Bob and I at kind of contemporaneously became interested in, in exploring it and getting documenting this species. So we made independent trips up to a couple of the peaks. There's three peaks, Sugarloaf Mountain, uh, Onion Peak, and um, <laughs> my name, the name is uh, escaping my brain right at the moment on the third one. But in any case, uh, these are areas that are pretty hard to access. The road restrictions are extreme. Um, many of the roads are private, privately held and some of the populations are privately held by timber companies. Uh, but fortunately one, Onion Peak at least, is uh, now supervised by the Nature Conservancy. I'm not sure who actually owns the land, but the Nature Conservancy is monitoring that, and it is a, uh, has one of the best populations with the largest number of plants. So that's fortunate. Um, the plants look somewhat like Castilea rupicola of the Cascades, um, but the leaves are broader and even more lobed. Uh, they're also completely glabrous on the stems, uh, which separates them from rupicola. And uh, they do have some, yeah, unusual color forms like the one you see second from the right that are kind of interesting. Uh, they tend to grow on basalt cliffs uh, or ledges in thin soil and they're often associated with uh, Penstemon cardwellii that you can see on the left at the base of the cliff. Okay, here's uh, one that you may not recognize as a Castilea that um, Guy Neesom, who is actually attending this uh, webinar, uh, described a few years back, Chloroceptron. Uh, it was, it, it's known from the central parts of the Sierra Madre Occidental, and um, it, uh, again, a, not a growth form that you would normally associate with Castileas, but if you look closely, the morphology is all there, the corollas, um, <clears throat> the lower lip, um, the four-parted calyx and so on. And uh, these plants grow in moist, sort of cloud forest, pine oak vegetation, uh, in basically along the edge of the Sinaloa and Durango border. Uh, they, we don't really know how widespread they are because the, they're really not very showy and so they haven't been collected very much. But at least from the collections that are existing, they're it's uh, definitely in common, if not rare species. Interestingly, there's another very closely and very related and closely similar species that occurs over in northeastern Mexico in the Sierra Madre Oriental. Uh, that one, which we'll see the, uh, some pictures of press specimens of, is still known only from the type collection. 
Uh, more, so more on that one later on. Uh, another species from Oregon that is pretty interesting and may not actually be all that threatened, um, but just not observed all that often is Castilea chlorotica. Uh, it occurs in pine forests up into the subalpine areas. Um, it was originally described from Gearhart Mountain down in uh, southern Oregon, but it has been found in a number of places farther north in Oregon uh, within the Cascade area. Um, it is very interesting in that it has a very hooked or curved uh, corolla beak, as you can see in the central pictures, and it's um, completely greenish to greenish yellow, not a very showy species, but um, does have that interesting corolla. Uh, it's related to the Applegatii complex, it has the wavy margin leaves, the glandular pubescence, and so on that um, identifies it as a member of that group. Uh, here's another very interesting and attractive Castilea that is endemic to the San Bernardino Mountains area uh, and occurs in high elevation pe pebble plains and then up onto ridges. There are two major forms. Uh, the one that occurs in the pebble plain areas and in openings in the coniferous forests uh, you can see here and it tends to be kind of yellowish to reddish to orange shades. And if you look on the left-hand picture, you'll notice if you look carefully that there are little bumpy things up on the top part of the bracts that look at first like they are could be hairs, but under magnification, um, and you really do need a, a microscope to see this, they're uh, crystalline excrescences. That is, for some reason, this plant um, puts out these little columns. They look like tuffa columns at um, Mono Lake uh, on a microscopic scale. And as far as I know, these are unique in the genus and not found in any other species. Uh, we don't really know what the function of them is. Uh, some salt marsh plants do this to excrete uh, excess salt, but um, this, this is not a particularly saline environment. And at least I don't know of any proposed hypotheses as to what the nature of these structures are, but in any case, an interesting fact about this, this species. Uh, if you go up on, on a higher elevation, up onto uh, a ridge that's above where the other forms of Cineria grow, there's another form that uh, differs partly in color, having this uh, wine colored, I've kind of informally called it variety vinicolor, although it has not been formally described. Uh, and it also has a difference in growth form. Uh, the plants are, the stems, as you can see on the right, are prostrate, uh, and just the very flowering tip becomes ascending. Um, that is mostly found in this form. Uh, I have seen some examples of plants at the lower elevation, the yellow and orange forms that have this growth form as well, but those are more commonly uh, ascending erect in their stem growth. So um, we're still trying to figure out if this really is worthy of description as a, as a formal variety or whether it might be better considered as a race, but um, it's a project uh, for future years. Um, back down into Mexico, uh, there's a form called, uh, a species called Conzatii, which is found uh, largely in Oaxaca and uh, it, it's related to a number of different species that are occur almost completely in Mexico. Uh, the only representatives of the group that come up into the U.S. are the uh, Texas paintbrush in Divisa and probably Coccinia, the widespread one in eastern uh, in the eastern U.S. This one is pretty distinctive in having the bright red-tipped bracts with white margined calices. And then the corollas are pretty interesting too, having the very long white hairs up on the upper surface of the corolla beak. Uh, and then a reddish margins of the lower lip uh, that are of the gaily uh, beak that um, make it very attractive and kind of cool looking. All right, uh, one of the plants that 
uh, we here in Washington are somewhat aware of anyway is the Mount Rainier endemic, Castilea cryptantha. Uh, it occurs in subalpine meadows, mostly on the north end, and then out onto the American Ridge area uh, close to Mount Rainier. Uh, it has not been found on the southern end of the mountain, which is kind of interesting, but it is found in the, the uh, meadowy parks that are near Sunrise area. Uh, you have to kind of know where to look, and but they are in some of the moist meadows, uh, and kind of mixed in with grasses. And um, they bloom late in the season, so you have to go in late August or early September to really see them in, in flower. Uh, they also are, it's the only species we know of that in Castilea that's truly selfing. Um, there was a study done back in the 1940s, I believe, uh, that did a pollinator exclusion study of them and found that uh, when the pollinators were excluded their seed set was just as as good as when the pollinators weren't excluded and um, there may be some other species like that in the genus but uh, they haven't been documented the way it has in this species okay um, down in san luis obispo county there is a fairly distinctive form of Castilea densiflora, variety obispoensis is an appropriate name for it. And uh, it's found only on the coastal grassland, mostly on the, the immediate terraces next to the ocean. Uh, if you drive along California Highway 1, you can uh, and find some of the terraces that haven't been disturbed. You can just park along the side of the highway and um, go out and walk through the meadows and find them fairly commonly, but they are re uh, very restricted to that one particular region. Uh, normally, most uh, Densiflora tends to be pink to purple bracted, although there are other forms of that have white bracts as well, particularly up in the San Francisco area, but they don't have the corolla structure and markings that uh, these obispoensis ones have, so it's not just the white bracts that distinguish them uh, but also the corolla structure. Um, Castilea elata uh, was for a while regarded as a variety of Castilea miniata, but uh, we split it back out as uh, to return it to the full species status. Um, it is found uh, only in serpentine bogs and has two color forms that don't appear to mix very much. At least I've never found populations where the two occurred together. We don't really know what causes the difference in the color, but it is pretty striking. Uh, the right-hand form obviously is um, pink-purple. Uh, these tend to get quite tall also, as you can see it growing on, on the right-hand side there. And then the left-hand form, that kind of yellow-orange color, uh, is uh, less commonly found, but it does occur fairly frequently as well. Uh, and again, the habitat doesn't seem to be all that different. They both have Darlingtonias in, in abundance around them usually, uh, and that sort of habitat. And there doesn't seem to be any difference in the habitat, but these color forms are, do seem to occur independent of each other and don't occur in mixed populations, at least not that I've seen. Uh, Gale Hintoniae is one <clears throat> That occurs only in limestone meadows in Nuevo Leon and uh, adjoining Mexican states there. It's very similar to uh, Castilea lanata, which is also found in northern Mexico and comes in, up into the Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, uh, West Texas regions. Uh, but it's mostly red to red-orange bracted, while Gale Antonia is uh, mostly yellow, although it does have in some forms a soft sort of peachy orange color like you can see on the right there, very attractive. There's also a difference in the amount of pubescence on the bracts, um, extends all the way to the tips on these, this species where as the tips are not so um, pubescent in Lanata. Um, back in the LA area in the San Gabriel Mountains above Los Angeles is an endemic form called Castilea glissonii. It's named after, oh, I left the double I, it actually should be a single I because 
the species was named for Mount Gleason, not a person named Gleason. Uh, so <clears throat> in any case, it's found only on Mount Gleason and then some of the areas that are adjacent to that in the central San Gabriel Mountains. Um, the picture in the center with the other plants around it uh, is actually from the type locality on the slopes of Mount Gleason. Um, it has divided hairs, which is kind of interesting and separates it from some of the related species that occur in the, the San Gabriel Mountains. Estelea hedinii is uh, found in the Southern Rockies and is um, really kind of a very attractive plant in the Alpine. It does seem to be a true Alpine species. I've never really seen it in subalpine habitats and it grows um, in the extensive alpine turfy communities that you find in the southern Rocky Mountains and then also down into the Sangre de Cristo range in uh, northern New Mexico where it's fairly common in the alpine. Uh, it looks somewhat like the in terms of the coloration of Castilea rexifolia, common Rocky Mountain species, but as you can see, the leaves are quite well divided in the species, whereas rexifolia has usually entire leaves. It also has kind of unusual corolla lip, which you can see a little bit of on the left-hand side, uh, but makes its affinities to other species in the genus a little bit difficult to figure out. It's probably been developing in isolation in the Southern Rockies for a fair bit of time. All right, uh, here's a pretty gorgeous plant that grows down in the forests in Oaxaca. Uh, it's a form of the Integrifolia complex, which is one of the most widespread in the genus, extending from uh, the Northern Andes throughout Central America and up into Mexico, almost to the US border but there are many different isolated forms that differ in various features. This one, because it had been described years ago as Castilea longibracteata, was easy to assign to a variety, uh, <clears throat> but there are many other varieties that probably could be split out within the Integrifolia complex. For instance, there's a form up in Northeastern Mexico and the Tamaulipas area uh, that has orange calices that are unlike the ones that you find further south. Uh, this form is distinguished partly by the fimbriate tips on the expanded uh, bracts at the top uh, that you can see probably best in the picture on the right there. Okay, um, here is one from <clears throat> the areas in uh, Michoacan, uh, there's one or two populations that have been discovered in adjoining Jalisco, but it's largely a Michoacan endemic. Uh, this one is Hiquilpana, which is named after a community that um, is right near there. In fact, we stayed in Hiquilpan when uh, we visited this area back in the 2000s. Um, <clears throat> it's a very airy plant and uh, has that unusual kind of zigzaggy white um, margin between the green and the red and the calices and uh, other more technical features that distinguish it from its near relatives. Um, back up in the Kaibab Plateau in north, uh, northern Arizona, uh, there's an endemic Castilea um, that was described by Holmgren not too many years in the past, and it uh, is somewhat similar to Miniata and another local species there, Integra, but it uh, is definitely separated from those um, and occurs in actually great abundance, but only in a few meadows. Uh, many of them are part of the Grand Canyon National Park and also the National Forest uh, that extends north of the uh, park borders and a place called Demott Park is probably where they're most common and they occur in a lot of different color forms as you can see here. Um, very rarely if ever does it have the the bright red color of Miniata 
and um, that one seems to be pretty much absent from the, that plateau anyway. Uh, they tend to be much more low growing as well, as you can see from these pictures. Okay, this one uh, is actually one that I described um, after visiting this wonderful area called the Scapegoat Plateau, uh, which is in the Rocky Mountains of uh, Montana, south of Glacier National Park. Um, it's near the Bob Marshall Wilderness, if you're more familiar with that. Um, this particular area is within another wilderness called the Scapegoat Wilderness, named after this high calcareous plateau. Really an interesting area. You have these snowmelt streams that come down out of the high mountains and uh, come out onto the flat meadows and then just disappear down into these limestone crevices. Uh, so a very unusual place to hang out. In any case, Castilea cariana um, is limited to that just a few meadows in that area and uh, also ridge tops um, that are very strongly limestone based. And uh, they also occur in a large number of color forms, as you can see here, and have a distinctive corolla structure that's um, only shared by uh, one of the endemics from the Wallama Mountains, Castilea fraterna, that we'll see later on. Um, <clears throat> the picture on the left shows you not only the high elevations where these occur, um, you know, eight to 10,000 species or feet or above, and then also how it's um, definitely on that white calcareous rock. Uh, its common associate is Dryas octopetala, that you can see a little bit of in the foreground there on the left as well. Um, this area is about 20 miles from the nearest road head, and so we, uh, Peter Lasica, who had originally found these plants up there, uh, and some of his friends from Montana um, organized a pack trip to go up there, uh, and the horses carried our supplies, and we just took day packs, which is good because I was not in nearly as good condition as those guys, and I probably wouldn't have made it if I'd had to carry a full pack. Um, first day we uh, went about 14 miles and climbed 4,000 feet elevation gain in the last part of the hike. So by the time I got to our camp, uh, <laughs> I was pretty beat. But the plants got me um, excited for the next few days that we spent up in that area, and it was uh, a great experience for sure. Uh, this is another recently described one uh, that was uh, found in Dolomite Glades down only in the place called Bibb County, which is just about in the center of Alabama. In fact, I stayed in a town called Centerville when I was there. Uh, and these are close to and similar to uh, Castilea coccinea, one of the widespread Eastern species, but they do tend to have mostly undivided bracts and the yellowish coloration, sometimes varying to pale orange. Um, Castilea coccinea has divided leaves and bracts and uh, generally is red to red orange, although it also does have yellow forms. But these are very um, uniform and restricted to just um, a very localized area. Fairly common within the area, and the area is protected by the Nature Conservancy at this point. So fortunately, these plants are not likely to be in uh, endangered in the new fu near future, despite the fact that their range is very limited. Uh, back in the San Bernardino Mountains, another of the former owl's clover species that was ca transferred to Castilea is Castilea lassiorenca. Um, this one <clears throat> is found only in wet seepy areas, uh, stream banks, and so on. And although it is found in several locations, uh, its habitat is fairly restricted and they certainly don't occur in great abundance. Um, and, uh, whoops, sorry. all right, up in Lassen National Park, uh, when I was in the process of describing a different species that we'll see later on, 
um, that is somewhat related to Castilea limoniae, a common meadow plant of the Sierra Nevada, um, we also started looking at uh, the form that was that's found on Mount Lassen, which occurs on volcanic rock, obviously, uh, as opposed to the granitic rock in the Sierras, and also differs from the Castilea limoniae in having a, a basically whitish corolla uh, versus the purplish form uh, that you find in limoniae. Uh, so it was originally described by Alice Eastwood uh, way back in probably the 30s as a distinct species. Uh, for a while, it was lumped into Castilea limoniae, um, just as a kind of an outlying population on Mount Lassen. Uh, but we decided that it was different enough and that different enough ecology that it deserved to be um, resurrected as a full species. So it is now regarded as endemic to the subalpine meadows around um, Mount Lassen, where it is fairly common, uh, but limited in extent. All right, um, yet another uh, uncommon to rare Castilea in California is uh, the beautiful Castilea mendocinensis. Uh, it's similar to Latifolia, which is also fairly uncommon uh, down in the San Francisco Bay down to Carmel region. But further north, uh, largely in Mendocino County, uh, out on the coastal bluffs, you find these plants. Um, they're not all that common and are limited to just a few protected areas. Many of their habitats have been destroyed for coastal development and uh, no longer exist in places where they used to be found. Uh, fairly recently, we found an po outlying population up in Curry County in southern Oregon. So that uh, extended the range out of California a little bit, although it's still known only from a single state park uh, where they're probably aren't more than about 40 or 50 plants total uh, in terms of its Oregon population. It is more common in California, but uh, again is threatened in some areas by coastal development. Okay, down in uh, <clears throat> northeastern Oregon in the area called the Mogollon Rim, which uh, is not just in Arizona, but rather um, extends into the adjacent parts of New Mexico uh, in the subalpine meadows there, a fairly distinctive form occurs named after the, the name of the rim itself. And one of the hairier species in terms of long hairs, as you can see on the left-hand side there, uh, it's again been affected by cattle grazing and in some areas where the cattle grazing has been heavy, the species has basically been eliminated. But fortunately, the Forest Service and other land managers up in that area are aware of it now and, and have taken some management measures to uh, control the effects on this species. I haven't been there in recent years, though, so I don't really know how well that's worked, but um, hopefully the species is still around there. Um, Castilea organorum is found only in the Oregon Mountains uh, outside of uh, Las Cruces in New Mexico. And uh, it's one of the taller species, as you can see on the right. Some of the plants grow five, six feet tall. They're not always that tall, but they can grow that tall. And they're also very well branched. Uh, this species is limited to that mountain range. Originally, they, uh, some of the botanists down there thought it was more common, but um, when we examined the species, the specimens from those other ranges, such as the mountains of western New Mexico, it turned out to be uh, Castilea ostromontana, uh, which is now called Castilea nelsoniae. That's another story that I won't get into right now, but um, in any case, the Oregon Mountains is where these are, are completely restricted to, and they occur not all through the range, but rather up in uh, the shaded canyons, um, in kind of crevices and uh, little shady areas where the plants are able to develop. Um, several other Castileas are found in the mountain range, so you have to look carefully to, to find these ones, which are much less common and restricted again to just a few specific canyon areas. 
Okay, here's a, another one of the species that was for quite a while regarded as a separate genus, Ophiocephala. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this, or I'm sorry, um, well, anyway, the names of, <laughs> are slipping my mind right now, but this was um, moved into Castilea through the genetic studies of uh, Dave Tank and others um, who determined that this species, very unique form, uh, actually its DNA does fall within the general Castilea DNA. And uh, the basic chromosome number again is the same and the DNA evidence shows that it is a Castilea. Uh, interestingly, it's pollinated by bees, which <clears throat> seem to trap line through it, just kind of settling on those well-exerted anthers, picking up pollen from them, and then just hopping on to the top of the next flower. Um, these are found only in the Sierra San Pedro Martir, which is a mountain range in northern Baja, California, not very far below Ensenada. And uh, it has a really interesting flora and has a lot of uh, great species, but up in the montane areas, uh, in kind of fairly dry meadows and open pine forests, uh, you find this remarkable species uh, occurring nowhere else on the planet. Okay, over in central Durango, near the town of El Salto, um, east of the city of Durango, uh, there is a species that was collected by uh, Pinnell way back in the 1930s, I believe, uh, but he never actually formally described it. And not too long ago, um, Guy Neeson described it as um, a full species, and it is very unique and interesting plant. Uh, it's a forest understory plant and grows, as you can see, with uh, some other uh, beautiful species like the Pedicularis angustifolia. Um, unlike the Pedicularis, though, it's completely limited to that area and hasn't been collected anywhere other than in the um, El Salto region of Durango. Uh, we were lucky to find these plants. Um, we searched for quite a while in uh, one of the main roads through the area where it was collected. Uh, this must be very close to the type locality, and we only found it in uh, two spots, although we had searched many other areas that seemed to be a good habitat for it, but couldn't find it. But these plants were beautiful and prime, so that made the hunt worth it. Okay, um, mostly in a few counties in the central Rocky Mountains of Colorado is another uh, really great uh, alpine endemic, Castilea puberula. Um, Dick Olmsted actually collected this on a mountaintop in southeastern Idaho just a couple of years ago, so now it's not no longer regarded as a Colorado endemic. Uh, but for the most part, it, it is, and um, there are not a whole lot of populations of it, uh, so it's regarded as a, at least a threatened plant in Colorado. Uh, there aren't a lot of dangers to its habitat, um, because most of it occurs in high elevation meadows and protected areas in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park and other areas like that. Uh, probably related to a more widespread species, Castilea flava, that occurs at lower elevations and mostly in sagebrush. Okay, another um, one that was described by Noel Holmgren not too long ago for his good friend and field buddy, um, Jim Revale, uh, is found in Bryce Canyon National Park on these limestone barrens with uh, they're incredibly glary. And when the sun is out, and almost uh, you need your dark glasses on for sure. Uh, so a very unique kind of habitat that they grow in and not very many other plants share that habitat with them. Um, it is found on one other area nearby, but uh, outside the park, but for the most part, it's endemic to the Bryce Canyon National Park area and only known from a handful of populations. 
Um, another limestone specialist down in northern Mexico and southwest Chihuahua is this um, really unique and gorgeous plant called Castilea rhizomata. As you can see, it has kind of interesting little uh, tiny leaves uh, and is very, very glandular. Uh, lots of gland tipped hairs kind of basically covering the entire herbage, stems, and leaves. And then these uh, very attractive inflorescences of deep red, uh, kind of crowning the structures. And then the plants are highly rhizomatose, so they form these mats, as you can see on the left, uh, some of them uh, several feet in diameter and um, spreading over considerable area. Uh, this particular species is very much limited to that area south of Creel in, um, in Chihuahua. There's another uh, couple of pictures of it showing the unusual leaves and stems. All right, um, you might notice this um, trend that a lot of these plants are from Mexico. And this is one of the things I wanted to emphasize in the show is uh, that there's so much that we don't know about the flora of Mexico and particularly the unusual Castileas down there. Uh, they have a lot of localized endemics. And um, I think this is probably true of many of the plant groups in the Sierra Madres uh, in particular. And it's unfortunate that you know there hasn't been more field work. Hopefully, while many of the Mexican botanists have, in recent years have become more involved in this, uh, there's a guy who's working on salvias down there that's done an amazing amount of field work and um, describing of new species and so on. And I suspect that the same is true for many genera, including Castilea, that there are species yet to be found. Um, hidden here and there in parts of the mountains that have not been explored botanically. In any case, this one is uh, another one that's found in the same general region as the Perelegans that we saw a couple of minutes ago in the pine forests, but this, this particular form, Saltensis, is found in, uh, as you can see, these wet meadows where often in the rainy season when they flower, the meadows are, have standing water. I've been to this same meadow where this particular picture was taken uh, in the dry season uh, and found basically dust, you know, bare soil, um, trash laying around and, and looking like very much unlike what you see here when, when there's been some rain and allows the plants to, to grow and develop. So some other shots of saltensis. Okay, uh, up in the Northern California, Southern Oregon area, there's this gorgeous Castilea schizotrica. Uh, it's found mostly in the Marble Mountains and in the Siskiyou Mountains, and um, only in dry alpine type meadows. Uh, it is somewhat similar to the widespread Castilea arachnoidea that's found in the Sierras and all, also through many of the mountain ranges in Northern California and up into Central Oregon. Uh, but that species is never colored like this and um, has several other technical differences that separate them. Um, this is this beautiful color is, I think, unique in the genus. Uh, there may be, there's other purplish species, but this, this beautiful particular shade that this one has uh, really is kind of unique. And the fuzzy uh, branched hair pubescence um, also adds to the attractiveness of the plants. Um, it's hard to get a sharp picture of them because of the, the pubescence that no matter how much work you do at trying to get a picture that looks sharp and well focused, the nature of the pubescence makes it um, appear to be kind of blurry. So <laughs> anyway, this is the best I can do. There's a couple more pictures of them. Okay, now to the uh, second major group. These are ones that 
are facing more significant threats or more immediate threats than some of the ones we've seen before, uh, and also often restricted to particular substrates or um, particular habitats. So these are ones that would be more regarded as threatened or endangered species. Um, and you'll notice, again, many of these are endemic to one particular site. This is a great example, uh, one uh, called Castilea bella, which means beautiful Castilea, and it certainly is, especially striking in person. Uh, and it's basically limited to three rocky alpine summits uh, in the Sierra Madre Occidental, or I'm sorry, that should be Oriental. That's, and not only said it wrong, but the slide is incorrect also. So this is in northeastern uh, Mexico, not northwestern. Um, this particular one uh, is the only site where you can get to it without extensive mountain climbing. Um, this is uh, Cerro Potosi, which is, has an electronic site on the top of it. So there's actually a gravel road that winds up the mountain through a really remarkable, beautiful forest. Uh, to the summit, which is where these plants grow, and they're entirely limited to the summit area. Uh, and again, growing in, in calcareous rock, uh, there are, are a number of endemic species up there, including Potentilla leonina, uh, named after the state of Nuevo Leon. Uh, the purple hairs on the calices are what make this a particularly striking species. And uh, you can see the purplish color are cast to the hairs in some of these pictures as well. Okay, now uh, a fairly common plant in the um, vernal pools of central California is Castilea campestris, variety campestris. But this is a, a different form that, that's related to, but different from, the, the common form, variety succulenta. It's distinguished by its uh, really long bracts, as you can see there, which um, are much longer than the flowers, and um, <clears throat> the yellowish corollas that are slightly different shape than the nominate form. Um, it's uh, really decreased rapidly from agricultural development in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, much of its former habitat, in fact, the place where I took these pictures a number of years ago, um, I returned there last summer to try to relocate them, and it had been completely wiped out and converted to agriculture. And uh, with the exception of a few places that are protected, um, this species is really in grave danger from uh, agricultural and, and also development of cities like Fresno. Uh, that spread out into the surrounding countryside uh, at appalling rates. So yeah, this, this one really is a, a rare and endangered plant. Okay, another uh, mountaintop endemic. This one um, found in, um, on Mount Harrison in southeastern Idaho. Uh, this is Castilea Christii, named uh, not after a religious figure, but actually after a botanist, uh, John Christ. And um, it is endemic to the summit meadows around the, the peak of uh, Mount Harrison, which also has a communication site on it. So it's fairly easy to get to. Um, it's kind of out in the boonies, but if you happen to get to southeastern uh, Idaho, it's fairly easy to drive up and see these plants. Uh, they're still fairly common in those meadows, but again, they're only found on the top of this one peak in one county in Idaho. Um, the thought was that they might be related to Castilea hispida, uh, but that's not at all clear whether that's actually true or whether that's a convergence. Um, species is, is a pretty interesting one and um, deserves more study in terms of its relationships. Okay, um, mentioned before about uh, species that was somewhat related to Castilea limonii, 
um, but actually turned out to be uh, very distinct from that species in terms of coloration and um, some other factors having to do with more technical features. Uh, this one is Castilea collegiorum. It was originally collected by a Forest Service botanist uh, who I described the species with, um, and she sent it to various people and nobody could come up with uh, anything that they thought it could be except maybe an outlying population of Lamoniae from California. But um, obviously these don't look like the purple plants that you see uh, down in the Sierras. And um, they're found only in this single meadow called Big Meadow, which is actually more like a meadow complex with um, coniferous forest kind of separating different lobes of the meadow. And um, it's uh, right near Pelican Butte, if anybody knows where that particular locale is in Oregon. Um, it's kind of west of Pelican Butte by just a few miles. Uh, not easy to get to. You have to go out some pretty bad Forest Service roads to get to it. But if you know where it is, um, it's actually fairly, uh, once you get to the meadow, it's easy to find. It, it occurs in many different areas spread around the meadow. But again, one only in that single place in the, the entire world. Uh, to me, it looks more like Castilea cryptantha, the Mount Rainier endemic. But again, it uh, does have some differences um, that separate it from that, and obviously widely disjunct from Mount Rainier. Okay, another Mexican form. Uh, this one endemic to the Colima volcanoes. Uh, the Colima volcano complex consists of uh, dormant and active volcanoes. Uh, uh, Volcan Fuego is probably the best known as one that uh, is steaming and periodically erupts with actual lava and explosions and so on. Uh, one just a few years ago after I visited there. Um, to the north of that peak, though, there's another volcano that's called Nieve, which relates to it being snow capped. And around the flanks of that mountain is found this beautiful Castilea cryptandra. Uh, it's, as far as I know, only found on that peak and is related to some of the other more common species in Mexico, but has very distinctive leaves um, and corolla structure and so on. Uh, it's pretty uncommon. We only found it in one spot, and there were probably no more than about 40 or 50 plants. But fortunately, they were in full flower, so we're able to get some nice shots. Okay, here's one that I've looked for <clears throat> quite a bit uh, and never been able to locate. Probably my most wanted Castilea species, as the birders would say, uh, Tenodonta, uh, which was described from a col single collection by Cyrus Pringle, who explored Oaxaca back in the 1800s and early 1900s. And um, the Mexican form of it is known only from this, the one type collection and then a collection by a friend of Pringles uh, from the same date. They went up there together and made their own collections. Uh, and it hasn't been relocated since. Uh, the location for it is kind of vague. Uh, but we went to the, the mountain range and went to what seemingly was appropriate habitat and could not find any species samples of it. There's also a form that's closely related uh, to it that I've called variety altorum uh, down in the uh, Sierra de los Chumatanes in, in um, Guatemala, which is not too far from actually the, the Oaxaca area geographically. And that one I've also looked at, looked for in Guatemala and was unsuccessful in finding it there as well. In Guatemala, it's only known from um, less than a dozen collections and most of them old, uh, back from the Stanley explorations. Um, we searched for it really hard in the Cuchumatanes, um, basically for four or five days continuously. Uh, in addition to looking at the other Castileas up there, but we were unsuccessful at locating any of the uh, sites where it had been collected in the past, or locating plants at the sites anyway. 
Um, <clears throat> so we don't know whether it's extinct or just um, greatly reduced, but definitely both forms are uh, highly endangered. Um, the, the center picture is a pic uh, picture of one of Pringle's collections, which uh, is really amazing to me uh, as a little aside. Uh, I don't know how many botanists are aware of Cyrus Pringle, but he was a botanist who collected widely in Mexico and um, basically traveling around by train and then getting dropped off by the train and then hiking up into the peaks uh, with an assistant or two and maybe a mule to carry supplies. And uh, the s conditions under which he was working and collecting plants were pretty primitive but his plants, are, the quality of his plants are really amazing. When you can see coloration in the, in the bracts like you can see here after in plants that are over a hundred years old. And um, he, his, he collected widely and his plants are distributed in many herbaria, not only in the US, and, uh, but also in Europe as well. So um, some of the plants he collected are known primarily from his collections. All right. Um, moving on to back to the Wallawa Mountains, which have several endemic or interesting Castileas, Castilea fraterna. Uh, this is only found on a few alpine peaks in the northeastern portions of the Wallawas and um, is somewhat related to Castilea cariana at least um, seemingly uh, the corolla structure is similar. Um, <clears throat> and also found up there is Castilea chrysantha, which is not really an endangered species or rare. It's actually fairly common and widespread in, in the mountains in northeastern Oregon. But um, one form that grows up in the Alta Alpine was originally called um, Owenbiana. And you see that form in the picture on the right hand side, that little paler colored paintbrushes growing with Castilea fraterna in this picture. Okay, uh, another one described um, primarily from collections by Dennis Breedlove and some other uh, Mexican botanists down around San Cristobal de las Casas in Chiapas. Um, Castilea filiflora. Um, Guy Neeson described this uh, just a few years back. Um, we, I tried to get to this area when I visited Guatemala a couple of years ago in 2017, but um, we were unable, we ran out of time to look for this area or look in, in the area where it had been collected before. Um, pretty interesting kind of rhizomatose plant and uh, <clears throat> as far as we know, only found in the areas immediately around there. Uh, one Mexican botanist I've talked to uh, through iNaturalist recently said that they've looked for it uh, around the city and have uh, in the environs of the city and have been unable to locate it. So we don't know whether development has wiped it out or uh, whether it still might be found there. But again, another Mexican endemic. Okay, this is uh, another species that I have not seen um, out on Isla Guadalupe, which is a, a large island quite far off the shore of Baja California, uh, which has uh, or had two endemic castileas. Um, this one, Fruticosa, still exists. Um, kind of a long story about these, this island, but like many of the islands in off the coast in California, uh, feral animals, particularly goats, were introduced there uh, by some of the early explorers and people who just brought goats over to colonize the land and um, succeeded in destroying much of the native flora, particularly on, on Guadalupe, um, until recent years the island was had basically been reduced to an, a barren wasteland of goats and um, I've heard the most common organisms there are earwigs and black widow spiders which makes it not a very inviting place to visit but um, the Mexican government eventually got around to um, killing off the goats and um, since that time the island has begun the recovery that hopefully will bring it back to 
at least a shadow of what its past glory was. Uh, and fortunately, Fruticosa survived down in the southern end of the island where there was more um, human development and a research station and so on uh, that enabled them to kind of keep the goats at bay in that region. So hopefully that will provide a seed location from which these plants can expand. Uh, the other endemic, um, Castilea guadalupensis, is thought to be extinct. It has not been relocated, although uh, if one had enough time and probably a, uh, a drone system, uh, they may have survived out on the outer cliffs of the, the island where uh, the goats weren't able to reach, but we don't know that to be a fact, and it, it is regarded as extinct, at least at this point. Um, John Redman, though, who again is um, Mr. Baha, Botany for Baja, has been out to the island and obtained these photographs of this pretty attractive species. Okay, here is one which actually is in the process of being described um, by me and um, a group of botanists from Texas. Uh, this is our tentative name for it is Castilea. Uh, Helophila, uh, because it grows in saline marshes right along the coast in uh, one very specific area near Port Aransas in Texas. It's not found um, in other uh, similar places along the Texas coast. Um, and this particular situation or ecological situation um, is very unique. Uh, it appears very closely related to Castilea indivisa, the classic a Texas paintbrush that is abundant throughout many parts of central uh, eastern Texas, uh, but is primarily red or orange bracted. Um, you do see occasional yellow and pale yellow variants, but white is almost never found in the main uh, Indivisa populations. So the white coloration on the bracts and calices is unique to this form. And also the very upright, strict habit and uh, taller growth form is unique. And especially the habitat, because um, none of the Castilea indivisas grow any, in anything like this uh, very saline habitat right along the coast. Um, you can see exactly how close to sea level the plants grow in the center right picture. That's uh, basically the the inland waterways from the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, this area remarkably was hit by the most recent hurricane that went through there just two or three years ago. And the eye wall of the hurricane came ashore right about at Port Aransas. And how these plants survived is really amazing, but um, it, these pictures were taken before the hurricane uh, in 2015, I believe. And but the botanists in, in Texas say that the plants are still there, even though this area must have been underwater and scoured by the storm surge from, from the hurricane. So remarkably, they, they do persist. Um, however, sea level rise from global warming is um, probably a more critical threat to this species than just about any other, certainly in, in Castilea. Uh, you can imagine what a two or three feet sea level rise would do to this species. All right, um, another uh, paintbrush that I described a few years back from central Mexico state of Hidalgo is one that uh, is endemic to these very highly uh, calcareous rocks, uh, almost barren, almost barrens uh, in this one central area near the town of Cardinal and a, a national park that's called the uh, um, Tolantongo Barranca National Park and the plants are only known from that area. I found these originally reviewing undetermined Castileas specimens from uh, some of the herbaria in Mexico and then uh, recognized that they were unlike anything that I'd seen before. So. Um, we, meaning myself and some of the other folks from actually the Central Puget Sound chapter of the Native Plant Society, uh, formed a little mini expedition down to Central Mexico. And we went a, a lot of different places, but one of the places we went was here to, to see this plant and photograph it in, in life. And 
uh, obtain a type collection. So it's a, a very small plant um, that grows in amongst rocks and uh, some other plants, tough plants that grow out there. Um, here's a picture of some of the people that were along uh, from, the, from our group. So uh, Jane Marsh, Linda Storm, and Ann Weinman from, uh, were part of our group. Uh, for some reason, none of the guys got into this picture, but uh, Mike and Fred were both there, as well as Peter Zika, who came along. And um, you can see me on the left uh, pointing to one of the plants. Um, if you follow my finger to a little teeny sort of yellowish spot, that's about the size of these plants. So they were not very numerous and uh, not very widespread even at that site, but um, we did find enough to, to see and to um, evaluate. Okay, another um, species endemic from Mexico is uh, back over in the Sierra Madre Occidental in Western Mexico. It grows mostly in down in the shady barrancas um, in Sinaloa and Durango along the Highway 40, a famous road, that, um, famous among birders anyway, and botanists, uh, that goes from the city of Mazatlan over to Ciudad Durango. And um, within that one area, there are 13 species of Castilea that are found, including um, several that have been only described in recent years. Um, this one I named for Noel Holmgren, who um, kind of mentored me in my early Castilea studies and uh, has, uh, you know, obviously done much to contribute to botany throughout the Intermountain region and uh, studying Castellet in particular, uh, I'm sorry, Penstemon in, um, for many, many years. So it was a, a real honor to, to name the species in, in commemoration of him. Um, the, sp the plants are really interesting in being covered almost entirely with glandular hairs, and then having those kind of large, wide, rounded, uh, often rounded anyway, uh, leaves and bracts. Okay, here's another one that I uh, looked for when I was in Costa Rica back in the, it was 2005, and Castilea lentii, who was named by Holmgren, uh, which was named by Holmgren for Roy Lent, who was an interesting neotropical botanist and kind of uh, eccentric hippie type guy. He uh, lived on a, in a communal living situation down in Costa Rica and was very, um, well, I won't say much, too much about him, but fortunately I was able, uh, he has contributed a lot to the botany of Costa Rica. And uh, fortunately, a couple of years before he passed away, I was able to meet up with him down there. And we went, actually went to one of the sites where uh, he had collected the plant. Uh, it's only known from four locations. Um, and the one where we went, uh, we could not locate any plants, even though it was the right time of year. So we don't know if it's there, still there or not. Uh, the photographs that you see here on the left and center were taken by um, a Mexican botanist who went out there with Roy Lent and um, took these pictures of the these young plants growing on mossy rocks. The leaf structure is pretty unusual um, and the plants actually get quite large and almost shrubby uh, as you can see in the specimen on the right. Uh, yeah so this is uh, one of the endangered castilleas from Costa Rica. Okay, uh, two others that I has still have not seen, but would love to at some point, um, were discovered by Hugh Iltis from the University of Wisconsin. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet Hugh before he passed away as well when he came to give a lecture to the botany department uh, at the University of Washington a few years back, well, probably 10 years now. Uh, but he did extensive work and was one of the co-authors of the Flora uh, de Manant Lan uh, of a particular um, rather isolated mountain range uh, in Jalisco. And they did a complete flora for this one mountain range and um, located these castilleas, which 
uh, two of which were described by Holmgren and one by um, Neeson, along with Iltis, uh, and the one on the left, Albo Barbata, which is um, likely part of the integrafolia complex, but it has these incredibly hairy um, corolla beaks, as you can see in the upper left there. Uh, the other two endemics we have don't have very good pictures of their old Kodachrome slides um, taken by Iltis or uh, some of his companions. Uh, the one in the center, Castilea McVaii, is a really cool species. It's uh, shrubby, as you can see, but you can't see the very uh, filiform leaves that it has that are quite striking. Um, <clears throat> there's a good illustration of it in the in the paper in which it was described, if you want to do the research to, to track that down. And then over on the right-hand side is um, Taro Collin, which is similar to a fairly widespread species north of there in the northern uh, Sierra Madre um, called um, Ortegiae, Castilla Ortegiae. Um, this is like a off branch of that and that could be perhaps seen as a variety, but it does have um, longer leaves and, and a couple of other distinctive features. So uh, we've maintained it as a full species. Uh, but all three of those last ones are completely endemic to the Sierra de Monatlan. All right, another um, very rare California plant um, is Castilea mollis. It was thought for a while that this actually occurred on the mainland, but we found that uh, the mainland's forms were very different. Um, Larry Heckard did a paper um, pointing this out and that the mollus actually is endemic to uh, the Channel Islands that are off the shore of uh, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara area. Um, <clears throat> this area is one that I've been fortunate to visit several times to look at the rare Castileas. Uh, and this species, which grows only on the coastal terraces in places like you can see in the picture on the right, uh, on the north shore of Santa Rosa Island, that's the only place it still grows. Uh, it used to grow on San Miguel Island in a small, small population, but that it was apparently extirpated by the grazing animals that used to be on these islands as well, um, but are now pretty much controlled. So hopefully, well, a lot of these plants are making good recoveries now, although Castilea mollis is still pretty rare and ecologically limited by this very specific um, coastal terrace habitat, sandy habitat. A lot of other interesting plants grow out there as well, including the astragalus you can see in the foreground on the, on the left. Um, this plant is usually yellowish um, in color, uh, but it does, there are occasional other colors as you can see here, these um, a golden yellow form, and then one that uh, ages anyway into kind of an orangey red color. Uh, and the other striking thing about this species is the prostate stems, which straggle out over the ground. And uh, you can see if the ice plant got out there, what trouble the species would be in. I would be completely overwhelmed by ice plant. Um, so hopefully that won't happen or it can be uh, contained. But a very um, unique and specialized species and one of my top 10 favorites in the genus, I think. Okay, moving on uh, to Castilea nitricola. This is found only in uh, a valley system that's found in the southeastern portion of San Luis Potosi state in Mexico. Uh, it's kind of an odd area and not one that you would expect to be high in plant diversity or, or particularly in Castileas. But in these um, kind of alkaline marshy areas grows this very unique species um, with a great corolla structure with the lower lip um, being quite expanded beyond what it typically is and and white colored contrasting with the, the greenish corolla beak. And then of course the great purplish color on the, the calices. The bracts, as you notice, aren't particularly brightly colored. They kind of mirror that purplish tone, but they tend to be duller than the 
the actual calices. It's going to be a very, very cool plant. Um, this one was actually described by Eastwood from um, early collections. Okay, um, <clears throat> this is Castilian nivibractea, another endemic to uh, Oaxaca in the southern parts of Mexico. And this one also is pretty unique coloration, starting out as white with the young bracts, which then fade to a beautiful pink shade. And many of the plants, um, as you can see here, are kind of intermediate in that process. And so they have kind of bicolored uh, inflorescences. Um, these grow up only on the upper slopes of a mountain called Cerro Quixoba, and I think that's the correct pronunciation. Um, we visited this area, another uh, plant society oriented group, um, and we met up down there with Gene Hun, who is, uh, many of you may know his name or know him personally, was an active birder and ethnobotanist uh, as a professor at the University of Washington for many years. Uh, and when he retired, he went, uh, moved down to California. But um, he, he did a lot of his research down in that area, uh, right near this mountain. And so he was doing research in the communities, the local communities down there studying their linguistics during the time when we visited. And he uh, met up with us uh, and went out to this mountain area uh, one of the days we were visiting and uh, found this species and actually climbed to the summit of the, the peak there. Um, it, it, I believe, is the highest point in Oaxaca. It's over 10,000 feet. Anyway, as you can see, these uh, get to be fairly well-developed plants with um, divided leaves and Again, this white pubescence on the corollas, which you can see in the upper right-hand corner picture, um, that seems to be limited to some of these species in southern Mexico. Not ones that are particularly related, though, so how that happens, something for uh, botanical research in the future to figure out. Okay, here is another one that um, actually has an interesting cast uh, conservation story right at this moment in time. This is Castilea ornata, uh, ornate paintbrush, probably because of the highly crisp, crisped or um, wavy margins to the leaves and bracts. And then also the fact that although it starts out as kind of a dull whitish color, uh, fades into purple to uh, reddish color, as you can see in the picture on the red, or on the right, and um, it occurs in Chihuahuan grasslands. Um, it's been collected a few times and described from Chihuahua, but um, most all of the collections from Mexico are very old and they haven't been able to locate any recent collections. Much of the area in Chihuahua at, where it used to exist has been converted to agriculture and, um, and, or, and or severely grazed. And so whether the species still exists there or not, we don't really know. It could well exist, but um, again, no recent collections. In the US, it was only discovered a few years ago, uh, well, about 20 years ago now. <laughs> I get older, a few years ago it seems, um, <laughs> it's a relative term, let's put it that way. Uh, anyway, uh, it was discovered by Laird McIntosh, who was a, a field botanist in New Mexico, and he sent it around and we realized it was actually a Mexican species and this was the first U.S. occurrence down in the southern tip of the Animas Valley. This area is part of the Gray Ranch that um, was much celebrated by the Nature Conservancy uh, when they reached a cooperative agreement with the land managers there, the private land managers, to um, use the area for, for its past use as grazing land and so on, but to manage it in a way that would preserve the native flora and fauna as well. And uh, while that has partly been successful, um, we're not sure that's extended to success with this particular plant. The other problem with it is that uh, it grows very close to the Mexican border. And you can see in the section, second picture, if you look at 
Uh, you can see lots of the plant in the foreground. Uh, this was from 1998, I believe. And there's a, in the right hand distance, right below the hills that you can see in the far distance, which are in Mexico, uh, that white spot is basically locates about where the Mexican border is. And this particular area, the Animas Valley and the nearby Paloncillo Mountains are, is a place where the border wall is being actively constructed. So we don't know um, what effect that will have, but you can see that the roads that lead down to the border fence pass right through the middle of this habitat where the photo was taken and is probably being used as an access point for all of the heavy machinery and uh, equipment and materials that are being moved down there for the border wall construction. Um, recent articles have pointed out that many of the landowners in that area really didn't want the wall, that uh, this was not an area of high smuggling or, uh, or illegal border crossings at all, and that um, the situation had been brought under control by just the existing uh, simple fence and the border patrol people and working with the local ranchers. But um, our current president needing to build lots of his wall uh, for his re-election campaign has been pushing ahead in this area, uh, which is now an area of active construction. So we don't really know what the effects will be, but it certainly won't help in terms of habitat destruction and perhaps altering the hydrology of these um, grassland areas as well. Okay, some uh, other Mexican endemic species. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I know the pictures aren't that great, but um, to point out that there are a number of other um, local endemics in Mexico which have never been photographed in the field and um, which I'd still like to see sometime. <laughs> uh, Castilea uh, porf porphyroceptron, which is the left and uh, left center pictures, um, is related to chloroceptron that you might remember from earlier in the show, but occurs up in the Sierra Madre Oriental. Um, I did actually look for that in the Sierra de Guatemala um, a few years back, well, actually in 1999, uh, but we were, it's only known from the type specimen, the type collection, uh, which is the picture on the left, and has never been relocated by anybody. I've, I've talked to several Mexican um, botanists into looking for it, but they, they couldn't find it either. Uh, when we visited, we weren't out, able to get high enough in the mountains to where the type locality is located. So although we looked where we could, um, we weren't able to find the plant. Uh, the species on the right, Papilionacea, um, is known only from a mountain range not far from there, not far from the Sierra de Guatemala, called Sierra de San Carlos. And that one is, uh, must be a quite showy plant in life. But again, it, it only exists from a handful of collections uh, from this one uh, rather isolated mountain range. Uh, it's not actually far south of the US border, but um, very few people ever go there. There's not anything in particular that would attract one to go, no special birds or anything. So, uh, and there's a lot of mining in the area. So we don't know what the status of the species is or even what it you know, looks like when it's in full bloom in, in life. So more things to study in the future. Okay, here is another Mexican endemic that I looked for and did not locate. Um, Gastilea racemosa, which was originally described as Gentria racemosa in a separate genus. Uh, you can see both why it was regarded as a separate genus and why it uh, might actually wind up in Castilea. It's a somewhat familiar corolla structure. Um, it is, uh, was located uh, by Gentry, who the, the genus name, the original genus name was uh, used for, Gentria. Um, however, the DNA evidence again showed that it is uh, definitely a Castilea. And 
Um, this is only found in the Sierra Surutato, uh, which if you um, know your narcos or <laughs> history, um, is basically the center of operation for the Sinaloa drug cartel. Um, this is where the folks that ran or, and run the cartel live, basically up in those mountains. And um, so I was <laughs> kind of crazy to go up there. I had several people from Arizona tell me I shouldn't go there uh, unless I was armed. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> not being a person that has even shot a gun during my life. Uh, I didn't uh, follow that, but I did locate a fellow who lives in Los Mochis in Northern Sinaloa, who runs mostly bird hunting tours in the marshes around Los Mochis. Uh, he occasionally uh, would lead people up into the mountains for other sort of hiking or birding. And I talked him into uh, driving me up there and he knew a lot of the local um, people in, in Los Mochis, including um, one of the military higher ups. And, um, and he speaks fluent Spanish and so on. So anyway, he drove, uh, drove with me out there. We spent a couple nights up in the mountains and um, had some interesting encounters with uh, some of the local people who were actually very friendly. And when they found out I was a teacher, uh, invited me into the town the next morning after we sat around the campfire drinking beers and um, they they brought out all the students from the local school and um, had American and Mexican flags and uh, <laughs> had, had pictures which I did not include here of uh, me with the Mexican school children up in the, this mountain village. It's kind of fun. But anyway, we looked around and could not find the plant uh, despite our best efforts. Um, I did locate a um, opium cultivation patch, uh, opium poppies, uh, while I was wandering around in the hills, which I um, vacated rapidly thereafter. Uh, <clears throat> but we did get out of the mountains safely, uh, but without finding the plants. A few years later, just recently actually, I hooked up um, through iNaturalist with a, a Mexican botanist from Culiacan, which is another town in Sinaloa. And um, he was very interested in looking for this. And I gave him all the information I had about past collection spots. And he went up to a different area, the second main region where it's been collected in the same mountains. It's just up a different road. And he was uh, successful in finding it. So um, these are his pictures. And um, he hope, I'm hoping that one of these days I can get down there, and go up there with him to check out these plants in person. In any case, it's uh, again, only known from this one region and um, definitely is a rare species. Okay, one of my, another of my favorite Castileas is Castilea rubida, which is found um, only on a few peaks in the Wallawa Mountains. Um, calcareous peaks, the geology of the Wallawas is, is in Northeast Oregon is fairly complex. So you have outcrops of different types of rock. And uh, Fraterna grows on one type of rock. And then on the, in the, at the same elevations in the Alpine, you find this uh, remarkably beautiful species uh, growing up in the high Alpine. Um, so this, these pictures were taken on the Matterhorn, if any of you have been hiking in the Wallawas, you probably know that peak, and a famous, uh, it's below a place called Ice Lake, which is a favorite hiking destination from the campgrounds and so on at Wallawa Lake. That's a, a good destination for a day hike or, a, or an overnight stay. And then up on the mountain above there, you can find this uh, gorgeous little species. It's related to Castilea nana and the Lapidicola form of that, which is found in the Sierras and the White Mountains and uh, some of the isolated ranges in Nevada, but it does, does differ from those species. Okay, another one in the um, <clears throat> same Pelosa Nana complex is Castilea salsuginosa. Uh, this one also has kind of a controversial story with it. Um, it was described from 
place called Montaniva Hot Springs, which is an undeveloped site, mounded hot springs, um, way out in the middle of nowhere in White Pine County in eastern Nevada. And uh, it differs from the normal Castilea pelosa, which is a widespread Great Basin uh, species in common in the mountains in California and so on. Uh, but they don't grow in hot spring situations in the valleys the way this one does. There are, uh, this one has a longer corolla beak relative to the lower lip and um, some coloration distance differences and obvious, obvious habitat differences from the widespread Castilea pelosa. Um, then a few years after this was described, there were other populations discovered at a place called Hot Springs Hill. So uh, here are some plants from the Hot Springs Hill population. Um, DNA studies were undertaken by a, a couple of different teams. Uh, the first team had really, I'm not sure they had everything identified correctly and the results were really kind of a mess. Uh, the team from Brigham Young University in Utah did a, a much better job with the DNA study, but um, their, their um, results were kind of mixed as well. What they found is that uh, the Salsuginosa from Montaniva um, was distinct from Nana, but that the Hot Springs Hill plant, which occurred in similar habitat, um, was sort of separate from either of the other two. So we don't really know or are waiting to, for further studies to determine whether um, these really are low elevations, see uh, Castilea nana, which occurs in the mountains around these hot springs valleys where these plants grow, whether it's a derivative from Pelosa, and whether Salsuginosa and the hot springs hill plants are the same thing or different species with the hot springs hill being an undescribed one. Uh, the genetic study showed some support for the latter conclusion but um, was not definitive enough to really base too much on. So another great project for an ambitious graduate student or someone else to, to work on is to sort out all of these different uh, forms that are related to Castilea nana and Castilea pelosa. Okay, um, this is uh, probably my second most wanted species that I've never seen. Um, this one is Castilea venusta, which also is a very restricted endemic, which has only been collected a couple of times. As you can see, it's an annual, and it grows up in the understory of pine fir forests on Cerro Teotepec, which is in the middle of the Sierra Madre del Sur in Guerrero. Um, if you know much about Mexico, this is also an area which is regarded as kind of dangerous to go into for a variety of reasons. Um, and especially in recent years, there have been some uh, killings and so on up there that have been pretty unpleasant to read about. But um, this would be a great species to see in life and to the best of my knowledge has never been photographed in, in life. Uh, I've talked to a few people about going out to look for it, but nobody has volunteered so far, uh, perhaps because of the danger of the area. I'm not really sure. It's also pretty remote and requires a, a full day of driving on, you know, gravelly mountain roads to get to. So hopefully somebody will make it out there, whether it's me or someone else. But uh, I can imagine it's a gorgeous little thing uh, to see in life. Okay, getting close to the end, or in the Vs, um, Castilea victoriae is another one that uh, Matt Fairbarns and I described a few years ago. Matt is a botanist um, who works primarily on, on rare and endangered plants on, uh, in, in BC. Uh, he lives in Victoria, and uh, we've become kind of buddies over the years since we first got together regarding this species. We've gone out uh, botanizing a number of times. Um, he, he found this plant uh, growing on Trial Island, which is off the coast of Victoria. Uh, you can easily take a, um, 
a canoe. What's the other thing? Anyway, the type of vehicle that people take to go out to places like that. Uh, anyway, um, he, he had um, found these out on the island and also seen herbarium specimens and said, well, these don't really look like what they were being identified as, which was either as Castilea tenuous, uh, a white flowered annual uh, paintbrush, sometimes yellow, but really doesn't look like this at all. Um, and or that being described as Castilea ambigua, which it also doesn't match very well at all. So he's saying this, this isn't really either of these. And so he wrote to people in California about it, and they said, well, I don't know, it's, I don't know. And um, right about the same time that he was reaching a dead end, um, people from the University of Washington um, herbarium, um, David Giblin and Dick Olmsted's uh, crews, uh, were actively engaged in surveying the uh, small islets and unexplored places in the San Juan Islands in Washington state. And they happened to make a brief stop on a small island that's not more than about an acre in extent called Iceberg Island. And they found some of those plants there and they didn't know what they were either and brought a sample back to the um, herbarium at the University of Washington where I was able to find it uh, and recognize that it was something I'd never seen before. And right about the same time, I got a note from someone asking me about Matt's inquiries from Canada and the fact that he had found plants. So I kind of put two, two, two and two together, especially when it was easy because I had specimens or pictures from both Trial Island and um, BC, and it was clearly they were the same thing. So we now know that uh, this species, which is unique and described as Castilea victoria, um, <clears throat> is a rare not only in Canada, where it's found primarily on Trial Island, which has by far the most populations and most numbers uh, anywhere in the world, uh, there are a few remnant populations on the mainland in the Oak Bay area of Victoria, but these are um, those ones are small in number and increasingly affected by human trampling, uh, dog walking, other sorts of things. Some of the habitat sites are cordoned off so that people can't stomp on them, but um, the fate of this species on the mainland of Vancouver Island is is questionable. Uh, and then over on Trial Island is the only place uh, in the U.S. where the plant is found, and the population there is very small and varies from year to year. So uh, these plants are from Trial Island, or Trial Island, yeah. And then this picture is, or these pictures are from Iceberg Island, uh, which is a small islet off the coast of Lopez Island in the San Juans. The only place in the San Juans that, that the species was located despite the fact that the um, UW surveys, survey teams went to a number of different islands during their studies. Okay, uh, here's yet another mountaintop endemic and another kind of interesting side story. This is also the longest Castilea name, I believe, Zempoatopetalensis, uh, named for Cerro Zempoatopetal on which it grows only at the very summit at about uh, 11,000 feet. Uh, that, that they're still forested up there at that um, latitude down in Oaxaca. So um, the, it's mostly pine, oak, and fir that grow up in the overstory. And then down in the understory uh, grows this very unique Castilea. Um, and if, again, only on the summit ridge. It, you know, we hiked up the mountain about 4,000 feet that day. Uh, when I was still suffering from a flu bug and um, another place that I almost didn't make it to but um, managed to persevere. Uh, it was misting that day too and but it did kind of open up a little bit right when we got to the top and um, so we were able to get a little bit of sunshine for these some of these pictures. The other interesting story about this is that the very summit of this mountain is regarded as a sacred site for the people who live in the nearby community of Santa Maria 
Tlahui Toltepec, um, which is a very organized, um, mostly indigenous community uh, that where we stayed uh, for a couple of nights when we explored that area. And um, they, a common practice for people is to hike up to the top of the mountain and sacrifice chickens and other sorts of, of goods to the gods, kind of similar to what you see at the um, altars up on the volcanoes in Hawaii. Um, people bring offerings, basically. Um, and the place where a lot of the fires and gatherings were for this purpose um, was where we found the Castellets. <laughs> and so uh, you can see here in the picture on the right, uh, the part of the fire pit, or sort of informal fire pit that was used by the people that hike up there. And uh, we also found chicken bones and a large number of other sort of things uh, kind of strewn about but the Castileas were there growing right on the edge of this little uh, ceremonial location. Uh, we didn't see very many plants at all, probably not more than about a hundred plants total. Although the first collector fellow named Hallberg um, who went up there described them as being abundant. Um, that was not our experience, but then again, uh, we only were at the top for probably two hours or so before we had to hike back down. So we certainly didn't make a, a good survey of the area. However, it still is um, the only place in the world where this particular species is found. All right, now uh, the last few slides, I wanted to show you uh, some of the plants that have recovered or uh, in this case, the ones that didn't make it, um, ones that are very likely uh, extinct in the wild um, or certainly <clears throat> uh, on the verge of extinction in the case of Guadalupensis. Um, I talked about Guadalupensis already, um, so I won't talk about that much, but it was uh, one of the second of the two endemics out on Isla Guadalupe in Mexico um, and only seen by a handful of botanists. I believe there are three collections of it from uh, the early part of the 1900s. And since then, it has not been seen, including by the uh, botanists who have made several visits to the island since the goats have been removed. Uh, Castilea uliginosa uh, is extinct in the wild. The last wild plant died in the 1980s. And uh, however, the plant was maintained through tissue clones at the University of California Greenhouse in Berkeley. Um, it looks kind of like Castilea miniata and likely derived from that species, but obviously has this uh, very pale um, yellowish white uh, inflorescence. Um, I was fortunate to visit the site, the last wild site, uh, with Larry Heckard, who ran the greenhouse and um, the only time I ever actually met Larry was this one day when he showed me the greenhouse where I took this picture and then we went out to the wild site um, where the plants were uh, basically on their way out. The, the plant, it was non-flowering, it become vegetative and the landowners weren't really managing it correctly and um, it's I guess since disappeared and no other wild plants have been found. Um, but it was an endemic to the Pitkin Marsh, which is now a, a residential area in Sonoma, uh, Sonoma County. Um, Castilea ludoviciana um, is probably just a um, derivative of the widespread coccinia uh, that grows throughout much of the south. But um, <clears throat> it does have some interesting characteristics. Uh, and so I did go look for it back in the 1990s and down in Louisiana, Jeff Davis Parish, where it was described from and could not find any plants, any Castileas at all. Uh, almost everything there had been converted to crops or, or plowed under for various purposes or paved over. So we never will probably know for sure um, <clears throat> whether this was actually a unique species or just a, an oddity um, <clears throat> displaced population of Castilea coccinia, which 
um, it very well may be. And then finally, Leshkiana, uh, which grows or grew out on the Point Reyes Peninsula, it was collected there once uh, from which it was described. Um, just the only collection of a press specimen is the type collection, which was um, a single plant. Uh, however, a place, a, a fellow called Charles Weber, um, who I guess is well known in, in Bay Area botany circles, um, collected and photographed a plant which he took to a Marin County flower show in 1960 um, from somewhere on Point Reyes. Uh, we don't really know where that was, where his collection site was, but comparisons of the photograph, um, which uh, the 35 millimeter slide is actually on file with the holotype for Leshkiana at the California Academy. And um, you can see when you look at the details of the photograph, the features are exactly matched by the specimens, uh, by the physical specimen from which the species was described. And some California botanists have said, well, this isn't the same thing, but it sure looks like it to me. Every feature, every character that's visible matches up perfectly with what's on the holotype sheet. So I'm, you know, in my mind anyway, it's 100% sure that that actually is a living specimen of that um, apparently now extinct Castilea. This is another one that I and many other Bay Area botanists have looked for in the past and not been able to relocate since then. However, there's a lot of territory out there in the dunes on Point Reyes and certainly is possible that it could persist there somewhere. All right, finally, um, three species that um, are, uh, or at least were, in pretty grave danger of being eliminated, but have made strong recoveries in recent years, partly due to the strength of the Endangered Species Act and the actions that are related to that, but also through dedicated work of uh, people to change management practices and, and bring these three into um, better condition. So the first is uh, Castilea grisia, which is endemic to San Clemente Island, which is completely owned by the Navy. And fortunately, the Navy, through the Endangered Species Act, took the conservation of this species seriously and uh, stopped bombing and running military activities through uh, its habitat. Um, most of the habitat is down at the south end of the island, near where, where it was described, at a place called Pyramid Head. Uh, these, most of these pictures that I'm going to show you are from that area, the type locality. And um, it's also a unique species in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, it's one of two species which are kind of shrubby on the California islands. You can see in the picture on the left, um, it's kind of in shade, but near the base, you see it actually has a trunk that extends down into the ground. Um, and then this poof of uh, stems branching out from, from the base. So uh, it, from the trunk-like stem, I guess would be the best way to say it. Uh, these form huge bushes, mound, mounds of bushes. This is actually a fairly small one in terms of its diameter. Uh, and the, pl the plants are quite impressive and a dominant part of the, the plant life in, in that area now that the feral goats and other animals have been uh, taken off the island or eliminated from the island. Um, they had kind of a disastrous airlift program that the Fund for Animals ran, um, which resulted in the deaths and abuse of many of the goats they removed. Um, they were basically just using it for a fundraising tool. Uh, in any case, the Navy finished the job by killing off the rest of the goats by shooting them from helicopters and so on. And since that time, the, the species, which really was at the verge of extinction, there were only a handful of individuals left, uh, has made a great recovery um, in just a matter of 20 years or so. Um, <clears throat> so... See here, this is uh, again Castilea grisia showing how large some of the plants can grow and how it again is, is part of this coastal terrace uh, habitat. Uh, the species also grows up on the canyon walls farther inland, which is where it survived um, the goat onslaught for a number of years before they were finally eliminated. 
And another island endemic, which was not quite as endangered as Castilea grisia, but was drastically reduced in numbers for a number of years, is Castilea hololuca. Um, this one has an interesting color distribution. It's found on four of the California Channel Islands uh, on, this, on the islands that are closest to the coast, Anacapa and part of Santa Cruz Island, the plants are reddish bracted, but on the other side of Santa Cruz and then on Santa Rosa and San Miguel Islands, which are farther out into the ocean, the plants are mostly yellow or a pretty peach color on some of the bracts. Why this color distribution happens in the basically in the middle of Santa Cruz Island, um, nobody really knows, but uh, all of the plants on Anacapa are red. They're mixed, but, but in separate populations on Santa Cruz, and then on uh, Miguel and uh, Santa Rosa, there you only find the yellow ones. So yeah, one of these interesting biogeographical phenomena. So here's the red form that uh, these pictures are from Santa Cruz. And then last, last one is um, Castilea levisecta, the beautiful golden paintbrush of the Pacific Northwest. Um, for many years, this was uh, regarded as critically endangered just about everywhere. Um, it had been basically wiped out from Oregon, extirpated from the Willamette Valley where it used to be, uh, what used to occur from many of the sites where it used to occur in Washington state, um, especially down at, around the city of Vancouver, uh, north of Portland, uh, where the type locality is, that's all housing developments now. And uh, even uh, it used to occur on Alki Point in Seattle, which obviously is not there anymore either. Uh, but it did survive in Washington on some of the glacial prairies uh, in down around Olympia and also out on the San Juan Islands, particularly on Whidbey Island and uh, San Juan Island. Um, <clears throat> And then it also is found on Trial Island, uh, that same place where Castilea Victoria grows uh, and used to occur in numbers around the city of Victoria. Um, now, since then, uh, the captive, captive breeding, not exactly captive breeding, but uh, breeding in nurseries and then replanting out into the wild has been attempted both by folks up in Victoria uh, who are in the process of establishing new populations around Victoria to try to reverse the extirpation of the plant from that area, which had occurred in the 1900s. And then uh, down in the Willamette Valley, the work of Tom Kay and the um, Center for Biological Conservation uh, has done great work in terms of reestablishing the species in the Willamette Valley area um, particularly by using some of the native prairie remnants in the National Wildlife Refuges like Finley, Ankeny, and Basket Slough, uh, several different refuges in the Willamette Valley that were set up mostly to protect wintering wildfowl, but are now serving as a, a, a real haven and um, reintroduction success story for Castilea levisecta. Um, counts in recent years have been in the tens of thousands of plants in, down in Oregon. So Oregon, where it was uh, for many years basically wiped out, has now become uh, the most abundant populations known for the plant. So again, um, another success story enabled by people who care about preserving endangered plants and um, have the time and the willingness and the funds to to actually make it happen um, in a long, in coordination with our legal system uh, that allows us to have things like state endangered species programs, uh, state rare plant botanists um, hired, and people getting out and finding these plants and, and assisting in their recovery as well. So anyway, I believe that's the last picture in my presentation. So um, I'm I know this has gone on for quite a while, and I don't know how many of you are still out there, but uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I can talk about Castilea for weeks on end, so um, <laughs> I'd be happy to take any questions, but I will need some 
help in terms of getting? Hi, Mark. It's Denise. And you do have some questions here. Elizabeth okay. had to go because she had a five o'clock meeting. So um, I want to thank all of you for listening and posting your questions. Please feel free to post more now. And we'll try to get to a few of these here. Um, Harlan Svoboda asks, how, is how important is DNA slash molecular work in figuring out the taxonomy of Castilea? Or Excellent question. Is, is morpho morph morphology typically sufficient for defining taxa? Well, you know, as with all groups, morphology was the only for many years, and most of the established species are morphologically defined, and even the, the recently described ones are, are essentially all um, based on morphological differences. However, DNA uh, studies have definitely um, helped figure out things like that, that some of these other genera that were separated out actually belong in Castilea, uh, even though the morphological evidence was questionable or, or you know, or open to different interpretations, I guess would be a way of saying it. Um, but we've been able to find that many of the groupings of species that were traditionally assumed from morphology, not so much the definitions of the species themselves, but which were related to which, uh, the DNA, DNA evidence has actually been pretty confusing. And uh, we're, people who work on those studies uh, are trying to develop at this time new tools, genetic tools for figuring out how to do the species level relationships and finding out, you know, is this actually synonymous with this other thing that sort of looks different or whether these are cryptic species that need to be pulled apart. So in terms of the broad, broader level classification, like, you know, what, what belongs in which genus and which family, the DNA of course is invaluable in terms of groupings within genera. Um, there's certainly some promising developments, but a lot of work I think still needs to be done from, from those that I've talked to. I don't have any expertise in molecular biology and not really interested in that part of the study anyway. On a, you know, <laughs> I'm a, much more of a field person, but uh, I'm, I'm in regular communication with folks that are involved in that. And I think at least one or two may actually uh, be in attendance or uh, were at the start. Uh, yes. And they are, they are making progress. And I, I'm confident that in future years, uh, you know, we'll be able to get much better resolution for things like groupings of species and interspecies relationships. Thank you. Now, the second next question for Castilea species, if replanting native areas, do these typically have a deep taproot structure or are they finer, thinner roots? Um, yeah, there are very few Castileas have really um, massive roots and certainly not deep taproots. Almost all of them are, would be regarded as fairly shallow rooted. Um, you know, many of them are annuals too, so they don't even have uh, complex root structures. Um, the bushy type species, like some of those island species, do have fairly well-developed and partially woody roots, uh, but they definitely aren't deep growing. They, they tend to just go down and kind of spread out, um, and they're, they're not, you know, you wouldn't, definitely wouldn't classify them as deep-rooted species in the, any that I've seen. Okay, and what is considered the diversity epicenter of Castilea? Ooh, good question. Um, well, really three regions. Um, the Great Basin area has a lot of species, um, but really the, the big two are California. Uh, California just has a ton of species, um, partly because they have the grassland annuals that used to be included in orthocarpus, things like Castilea exerta and Densiflora and several of the species I've showed you today. Uh, 
uh, Lacey Orinka, and those used to be Orthocarpus. Um, but also because of, uh, like with many plant groups, the diversity of terrain and um, soil types and uh, microhabitats and so on that exist in California have uh, developed a lot of diversity in, in Castilea as well as uh, many other genera like, you know, Mimulus or Erythranthi and all of those uh, types. So yeah, very diverse in California. And then um, hopefully, as you've learned, uh, the third uh, major area of diversity is Mexico. And in particular, the uh, Sierras, uh, Sierra Madre Occidental, the Western ranges that extend from Sonora down into the Southern part of Mexico and um, Sierra Madre del Sur, which is kind of like the Southern branch off from the Occidental. Uh, those areas have many Castilea species and um, many likely still to be discovered. And Emil Doyle asks a second question, he asked the prior, can you speak very generally to the hemiparasitic nature of the genus with a couple of examples? Well, as far as we know, all of them are, are all of them are assumed to be hemiparasites. Um, they've been a lot of species have been studied in greenhouse studies uh, for their <clears throat> and you know proved basically to be hemiparasites. Others have never been tested in a laboratory or greenhouse type situation. But um, basically, all of the plants in Orobanchaceae and in the <clears throat> Castilea slash Pedicularis part of what used to be the Scrofulariaceae are regarded as hemiparasites, and we don't know of any exceptions to that. Um, probably the most uh, broad-based experiments were done by Larry Heckard many years ago in the 1960s, I believe, uh, where he did an extensive greenhouse study at Berkeley, um, testing around 20 species uh, for their, to see how they compared to being grown with a host versus without a host. And all of those species, except for one, had um, more vigorous um, growth with more stems and so on and greater seed set uh, if they were grown with a host, which was usually um, sunflowers, um, uh, just the common sunflower that they used as a host. Castileas are likely, or at least few species are likely um, species dependent or linked to a single species. Some have a different preference, for instance, Castilea cremosa and, uh, grows and in our state, uh, Thompsonii are very fond of sagebrush and are rarely found away from them. On the other hand, both species can be found growing away from sagebrush, so they're not obligately tied to that. The one that I think is the most obligate of any that I know is uh, one that we didn't see in this slideshow from northern Mexico and Texas called uh, Castilea rigida. That one is almost always found growing in close proximity with uh, agave lechuguilla and uh, small agave species. And virtually every photograph and every plant I've ever seen of that species has been with very close proximity to the agave. And its range is also kind of tied to that. So, uh, but otherwise, for the most part, um, the plants are not host specific but they definitely are hemiparasitic in that the vast, vast majority of them in the, in the greenhouse study uh, grew much better with a host than they did without a host. But that points up that they are hemiparasites, not parasites, and they are capable of still reproducing, but not as vigorously, uh, just on their own chlorophyll. Thank you. We have a question from Fela Schwartz. However, I think Fela had to leave us, but her question is, what environmental conditions and speciation mechanisms cause so much speciation in this group? And she realizes this may be another entire talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I mean, I, I kind of touched on that when I was talking about California, you know, these specialized places that happen to develop as, as a result of plate tectonics and mountain uplift and erosion of mountains and 
um, you know, areas that used to have more rainfall and suddenly they have less rainfall and all of these different factors of environmental change, you know, result in changes in species. And if they get isolated, they'll go off in their own evolutionary direction. And uh, <clears throat> that's likely what's happened with many, if not most large genera, is that they have, you know, were widespread at species at one time that for whatever reason become isolated out and uh, more specific specialized habitats form and that cause them to be isolated. On the other hand, you might have um, sort of founder effect sort of things where a seed from a common species that normally wouldn't grow on a particular substrate like serpentine or, um, you know, highly mineralized soils of various sorts um, are uh, one particular seed or one small group of seeds might do better or are able to survive and reproduce there and then um, you know kind of start off in their own direction but again that's uh, pretty much conjecture on my part <laughs> Thank you. We have lots of comments. Um, this one from Walter Fertig, our rare plant biologist here in Washington. He says, thanks, Mark. Lots of great photos and fun stories. Uh, Gail Trotter <laughs> asks, what uh, are the seeds similar in size and shape across the Castilea genus? Well, it depends on what scale you're talking about. If you break them out of the seed pods, they look very similar. You know, they they all have a kind of a pear shape, a roundish pear shape where they're wider at one end and more narrowed at another. But even within one seed capsule, you'll see a lot of different, you know, subtle variations on that. Um, Larry Heckard and T.I. Chuang did a lot of research on uh, seed coats, uh, uh, in, particularly in the Californian species and the species of the Great Basin. And uh, they were hoping to see taxonomic categories out of that work. Uh, for instance, there are some seeds which have tightly fitting seed coats that uh, cling to the seed when, it, when even when they're dried, uh, whereas in others, the seed coat separates from the actual seed uh, and it's called a loose fitting coat. And then there are reticulations or box-like structures that the other way to describe it is the seed coats are netted. So you have these little individual segments or boxes, and those can be thin walled or, th or narrow walled or, uh, let's see, I'm getting my terminology right. They can either be deep walled or shallow. That's, that's the main category. And then within those walls, uh, they can be smooth, smooth surface to the walls or um, sort of a rough edge to the walls. So, uh, and each species seeds has different combinations of those characters that I just outlined. Uh, and you can expect the seeds of one species to match other examples of that same species. But uh, in terms of it being a phylogenetically useful trait, um, I don't think it proved to be as rewarding as they had hoped when they put a lot of time into that research. And, um, you know, they published several papers, uh, descriptive papers about the seed coats, and they made some tentative conclusions, but I'm not sure how, how useful those were on a broad scale. They've been used in a few categories, but um, not it, it hasn't been widely used to, to separate species or to define groups of species. Thank you. And what Molly Border says, thank you, Mark. A great presentation. I love to see the diversity from Mexico. And Richard Dro Droker says, thanks for the fascinating presentation. Wonder how many miles you've walked in pursuit of Castilea. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few. <clears throat> Very Although good. driving, it would be far larger. Um, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah. And Don Jacobson asks, has any work been done on the host species of the endangered species? 
You know, I'm not, uh, not a lot. I imagine Tom Kay um, down in Oregon has a lot more information than I have at my fingertips about Levisecta in particular. Um, and that, but I don't know of any broad scale studies on other species uh, in that regard. And again, because the, the plants don't tend to prefer one particular species over another, um, or, or will, ex will be able to penetrate the roots of a wide number of species, you know, grasses, lupins, penstemons, all kinds of different plants are parasitized. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that's been very useful in terms of the endangered species work. It's, it's more the plant associations and habitat characteristics and so on that are very rather good. than which species are parasitized. Very good. So the rest of our comments are comments and lots of thank yous, Mark, for fascinating presentation, beautiful pictures, very interesting, excellent photos, interesting background stories. Um, so I can share this chat with you so that you can see all these fabulous comments because they appear to come from far and wide, as was our attendance for today's webinar. Right. Well, thank you, yeah, to anybody who's still out there. This is what yeah. I love to do. So <laughs> it's been fun assembling this slideshow and uh, we'll it's beautiful. Keep at it. beautiful. Um, I didn't realize it. I looked at my clock just now and <laughs> this for two and a half hours. Yes, yes, you must be um, ready for a tall glass of water or something. Right. Anyway. Yeah, that's to set a record for <laughs> webinars. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank you all for attending our webinar tonight. Uh, we have a busy schedule ahead of us. The next webinar is tomorrow evening, which is a set of three native plant gardeners from the Puget Sound region, Clay Antio, Julia Bent, and Rita Moore. I hope you can join us as they share their garden tour. And on Friday at lunchtime, we have Donovan Tracy speaking to us and showing us the beautiful alpine flowers and wildflowers of Mount Rainier. That Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. And then on Saturday, we have past president Don Schachtel sharing with us um, how to hone your plant ID skills using the WMPS plant list data sets. So I hope you'll all consider attending another webinar with us. And I wish you all a very happy Earth Day. Thank you for being here, Mark. Thank you. Take care. Okay. All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs> I, oh. We did good. <laughs> yes, thank you. There's still some folks just Check it out. But yeah, yeah. All right. Well, you, we you. had we had 124 at wow. the height of attendance. That's which great. Was really good. Um, I think we had about 50 uh, signups today, so um, it's pretty great. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you so much for all your work. That was quite a presentation. So oh, thank you. I could see why you kept saying to me, well, I'm still working on a few slides. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I think so. I was adjusting the last image about 10 minutes before we started. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, this has been great. And 